Sex is a pretty complicated business in Mexico. The country is all about passion and temptation. Yet, there are many taboos. After a party, it's rarely a case of your place or mine. Many couples prefer to use a love hotel. They even have menus for sex toys, right next to the condoms. The once revered macho man has come under attack. Women today want more than just a traditional role. They are fighting for change. My sincere wish is that they too will conquer the world and fight for their dreams. Mexicans love sex, but they like to keep it hidden, going back and forth between the traditional and the modern. Mexico City. The angel of independence towers auspiciously above the capital. The megacity represents everything which is Mexican, a blend of folklore and progress. Lovebirds canoodle on every corner. Public displays of affection raise no eyebrows here. But there's a reason these intimate moments do not take place in private. Daniel Acuña and Jennifer Uriarte have been together for a year now. Both of them make a living from singing, like here in this restaurant. This is how they met and fell in love. I feel such strong passion when I'm together with him, not just sexually, it is real love. I love everything about him, the way he does things, his voice, the way he looks, his eyes. I think he's wonderful. He is 30 years old, she is 20, and they both still live at home with their parents. This is usual in Mexico, often until a couple marries, partly out of tradition and also because money is often tight. Many incomes are low, and during the pandemic, it was hard for them both to earn money. When work is over, they can't say, let's go back to my place or yours. Staying overnight at the partner's family is taboo, and sex is completely out of the question. Of course, we want to be together, but her home isn't very nice for us, and neither is mine. My mother can be a bit difficult. We can't do much alone. We can't even watch a film together. They'll meet again tomorrow. Weekend nights in the city are wild, fun-loving, and colorful. Love is love, and it's lavishly celebrated in Mexico's capital. There seems to be no sign of any taboos. It's Mexico's colorful, modern side celebrating sexuality. Daniel and Jennifer like it a bit quieter, though. One of their favorite places is a park. They can be alone here, far from the eyes and ears of their parents. We were sitting together in the living room, watching a film. Suddenly, I heard no sound from my mother's room. She turned down her television so she could hear what we're up to. So, we don't really have any privacy. Even if we had a big house with a room where we were not disturbed, it's still a question of respect. It's a cultural issue. My family is there. My mother is there. I wouldn't feel comfortable. You need to work out to open this thing. (laughs) 
Daniel feels as long as you live with your parents, you should respect their rules, their sensibilities, and their taboos. The idea of them catching me having sex fills me with dread. You get a lot of scorn or comments like, there are other places for that, aren't there? Get a room if you want to do that. Your own parents or even friends say it. So young people are supposed to have sex in hotels. This couple goes to one regularly when they're feeling amorous. But they're a bit too embarrassed to show us their favorite hotels. There are menus for sex toys. They put them right next to the condoms. I'm very curious. So I was really excited the first time. I thought, wow, a love chamber. Fabulous. How fun. At least I know he can swim now. <laughs> the capital is teeming with love hotels. No one can say exactly how many there are, but there are lots, with a price range to suit anyone. Love hotels are in such high demand that they provide a good business for some people. Aurelio Vasquez is a designer for a special kind of love hotel. Here is the entrance. It's very discreet, very private. And here directly you can see the prices. A night costs between 30 and 100 euros, and payment is made directly at the entrance. No one can see from outside who is entering the hotel. Everything is discreet. We enter and park here, and the doors close automatically. Then you're basically already in the hotel. Aurelio has already designed over 50 hotels. With room service, you can order food or drinks, or even sex toys, condoms, lube, a little bit of everything. When the waiter comes, he puts the order in here tells you, closes it, and the customer on the other side takes the order out. The whole process is completely discreet. You don't see each other. Aurelio is convinced. A happy sex life makes for a happy society. To this end, he has created various themed areas, all created to stimulate desire. The shower is open, so you can explore voyeurism and exhibitionism. You ask your partner to shower while you watch. You spy on them, and they put on a show. The idea obviously works. It looks like a wet and satisfying pool party took place here. <laughs> One of my regular customers says, if you want an uprising in Mexico, close the love hotels for three days, then you'll have a revolution. <laughs> José Luis Vázquez and his girlfriend, Karen Pina, are regular customers in love hotels. They're not short of money and have their own apartment, but they find the change of scenery stimulating. You come here with the feeling of wanting to really enjoy it. It's no ordinary night. At home we also enjoy each other's bodies, but here you have a certain extra. It's something I love. When I'm in a love hotel, it brings out my inner porn star. You're more relaxed and more in the mood for something special. Not the same old routine. They are very impressed with their room. It creates a few options for an interesting afternoon. This couch is deeper than usual. It changes the angle. In certain positions, the angle of your partner's pelvis is really important. It feels different, and this thing makes it easier. You don't need extra pillows or anything. 
the mood is just right. There's only one factor getting in the way. It's time for us to go. It was nice meeting you. Take care, we're going to have fun now. Bye. A few kilometers away from the capital, an exciting day is beginning. Reki, hurry up, it's getting late. Have you packed your bag yet? It's the daily morning rush for Nancy Ortiz. She's preparing a quick breakfast and helping her daughter Regina with her braids. Nancy is a strong woman, a law graduate, a single parent, independent. This makes her different from many other women in often traditional Mexico. School has just started after the COVID pandemic, and Regina is happy. She has big plans for her future. I want to be a surgeon. You know, Regina, you can do anything you want in life. You have to work really hard to achieve your dreams, but you can do anything and show the world that we women can do anything. Nancy would make any sacrifice to let her daughter grow up in a fair society. Mexico is still far behind. Men have special rights, as Regina has noticed. Some parents say, you don't have to clear the table, you're a boy. You have to wash the dishes because you're a girl. That's not okay. They should teach children that everyone is equal. Today at school, there's a festival for Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, a joyful celebration in Mexico. Nancy and most other parents prefer to accompany their children to school. Here in Naucalpan, there has been a lot of violence lately, especially against women. It's very unsafe on the streets. So many women have disappeared. When you go out, you see photos and news about women who haven't come home. In some parts of our neighborhood, you even hear about murders. About nine underage women disappear per day in Mexico. That's 3,200 a year. Almost 2,000 women were murdered in the first half of 2021. Over 500 cases were officially femicides, murders of women, motivated by jealousy, possessiveness, or misogyny. Nancy's freedom as a woman has not been easy to achieve. Her family is deeply conservative. She has paid a high price for not marrying and enjoying sexual freedom. Her father is disgusted, and relatives avoid her. What will people say? It's the first thing you hear. Our reputation, it's a heavy burden for us women today. The more partners you have, the more you are condemned. It's different for men. They're allowed to talk about it openly. They brag and celebrate it with their friends. A woman can't do that. This high school was the turning point for Nancy. She was the first in her family who fought for the right to study. Here, she was inspired with new ideas, feminism, and equal rights. A woman's destiny, children, church, and kitchen, was not for her. She took part in student protests and became a rebel. My father was ashamed when people asked him about it. He thought of his daughter's reputation. She was here with all these young people. His biggest worry was that I had surely lost my virginity with 200 men. He said awful things about me, that I was worthless. The new school year is just beginning. For these young women, high school already seems like normality. But in Mexico, women's education is still often deemed a waste of time. Nancy spontaneously cheers on the class with the school's battle cry. I am very moved to see them here with all their dreams. At their age, I was so nervous. It's a crucial moment in their lives. My sincere wish is that they too will conquer the world and fight for their dreams. Things get even more emotional for Nancy later when she meets her family at home.
Jaime Saenz is a construction manager in Mexico City. His work is in a classic man's world. Jaime sums up the dominant idea of what makes a good, real man in this environment. We have a very traditional image of the man here as the breadwinner, the protector of the family who watches over his own. The dark side of the strong, protective man is machismo, an often used word in Mexico. Each colleague here knows one and can tell their stories, but none of them believe that they themselves are machos. My brother almost killed his wife out of jealousy. He hurt her and went to jail for it. I told him, you are crazy, this is evil. Your jealousy is not acceptable. That's how it happened. Jaime would admit today that he was a macho too. He had cheated on his wife countless times, had a major affair on the side for years, and got into fights with men. Today, at the age of 64, I am in therapy. I had to recognize that I had chosen to follow the traditions and the toxic rules of my parents. Jaime is undergoing macho therapy with therapist Ricardo Ayon. Ricardo works with men convicted of violence against women and men who recognize that they have a macho problem. Ricardo is doing all he can to bring about change in Mexico. I am convinced that change is possible and that we have a chance to banish machismo in our country, for us men to banish it from within. It has a negative impact on our lives too. In a group meeting, the therapists analyze the different aspects of machismo. What is defined as violence? Who encourages it? How should it be stopped? The goal of the organization Gendes is to prevent violence and achieve gender equality. There's still a long way to go. We are taught that sex is only penetration, that we need to have a huge erection and be ready to conquer her any time. All of this pressure means you can no longer perform, or you climax too soon. And then you blame your partner. They say machismo has something to do with believing that you're better than everyone else, of believing that you have to be better. This comes from one's upbringing, religion and the media. This feeling of superiority can lead to violence against women, even during sex. My patient says, I come home and I want to have sex. I don't care whether you're asleep or tired, your body belongs to me. That's how it is in pornography too. And we pass on this behavior, generation after generation. In Naucalpan, Nancy is doing the final shopping for a special family reunion. The single mother has to work, do the shopping, and take care of her daughter. Regina's father, like so many men in Mexico, took on zero responsibility. Men have always been taught that they are better than women. So they have the freedom to choose whether they want to take care of their child or not. They can simply shirk their responsibility. Hardly any men in Mexico are willing to use a condom. They find it repulsive. The mentality is changing a bit, but usually it's the woman's responsibility. Today, four generations are meeting for lunch. Nancy's daughter, Grandma Rosalia, and Adelaida, and Nancy's mother, Esperanza. For once, the men aren't present, so the women can talk freely about sex, a taboo for Grandma Rosalia. When I was young, nobody talked about it, and we didn't ask. We were told to keep quiet. The subject was off limits. She never talked to me about it. 
and I never asked her. I went to a neighbor for advice. She already had children, so I could ask her. But my mother, no, I never asked her. For Regina, it sounds like something from another world. My mother told me the facts of life as a child. It was a totally normal topic. Well, it was normal for me. But for many others, it's not. They're brought up differently because many families aren't the same. Issues that were never broached before are now coming to the table. When I started menstruating and I told my mother, she got very angry. I don't know what was wrong with her, but she was very angry. <laughs> yes, I remember that. I don't know why I was like that. Maybe because no one had told me and I had to go through it alone. I explained it to my son sometime later. He is three years younger than Nancy. I don't know. I explained it to him, but I should have explained it to her. For Grandma Rosalia, a woman's place is in the home, taking care of her husband and children, as her daughter Adelaida did. But still, Adelaida's husband started a second family on the side. In Mexico, they call it the big house and the little house. I am the big house. Here we also call the wife the cathedral, and the women they have on the side are the chapels. He brought her home with him. I guess he wanted me to meet her and my mother-in-law too. Later he told me, I'm together with this woman and the baby is my daughter. I could have killed him. I never expected it from him, but his brothers did the same. It's pretty common here in Mexico. It didn't happen to me. Or maybe I just don't know about it. To this day, men still have different rights than women. The sons inherit the house and farm and are supported by their father, while the daughters are dependent on their husbands. Esperanza and Adelaida had to ask for permission to go to work. When a son comes into the world, he's the pride and joy. But if it's a girl... It's typical in Mexico. When a girl is born, it's, oh, it's a girl. With a boy, it's, wow, a celebration. Reminiscing is often bittersweet, sometimes painful. I never received love. Would Grandma give her blessing to Adelaida today if she left her unfaithful husband? My father said it's very bad and a sin to leave your husband. If a daughter quarreled with her husband and he threw her out, my father said he was sorry, but he would not take her back in. I find that tough. If something bad happened to my daughter and she ran away and came home, it would not be right to turn her away. The women take time to feel their pain. None of them think things can or will go on like this in Mexico. Jaime has a one-to-one -one session with his therapist, Ricardo, today to banish the inner macho that almost ruined his marriage. I demanded a lot of sexual things, and if I didn't get what I wanted, I took it as a good reason to get it somewhere else, to cover it up. I told my wife she was crazy. You're crazy. You're dreaming. It's your imagination. But no.
Jaime couldn't handle the guilt anymore, and with his therapist, has learned to take responsibility. I was deeply sad for two or three weeks when I realized what a violent person I am. Yesterday, he's proud to say, he did not fight with his neighbor, even though the neighbor attacked Jaime. Your learned response would be, react, confront, defend, but you can't let that happen. I have the opportunity to choose not to repeat old behavior, behavior that has hurt me and others so much. Jaime wishes all men knew about this therapy. He thinks he's come a long way. But at home, he encounters a different reality. His son Rodrigo thinks that his father's generation are all hypocrites. I don't like living in a country where 11 or 12 women are murdered every day. And knowing that about 90% of all cases go unpunished. You guys always complain about violence, but you're the first to use it. Telling us, you have to respect women, and then writing, look at these chicks, sending around all this pornography. Now I can say to those guys, stop sending me stuff like that. Before I didn't dare, I just didn't dare. Schools are also a big problem. They don't practice what they preach. Everything to do with sexuality or sex or lust is seen as a sin. And you're supposed to repent because it's something bad. In my school, there were teachers who went out with middle and high school girls. That's not right. You mean that they had sex with underage girls? My school was sleazy like that too. Everyone knew about it, but no one said anything. There's a clear deficit between how it looks and how it really is between the sexes. In Mexico, it's the Day of the Dead. For Nancy's family, a loving remembrance with no anger. They make their dead's favorite meal, so their soul can rejoice when they come to visit. Nancy's view of the future sharpens into focus as she contemplates the past. Today we have the power to change what we don't like, for today and forever.